So welcome everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edward and Northampton Adas, for enabling us to um, learn every week together. Please God, in the merit of all, all the Torah we're going to learn, there should be peace, there should be redemption, there should be salvation and the ultimate redemption of Mashiach. So we're going to start chapter six. So this is an amazing book for those, I think it's Francesca's first time to join us. This is a, a beautiful book. Here is the book called Misilash Yisharim, Path of the Just. If you don't have one, get one. Written by the holy, the Ramchal, of Moshe Chaim Lutzato, the great Kabbalist born in 1707 in Italy, wrote an absolute masterpiece about how to self-develop and how to grow and how to actualize one's potential. So till now, a quick recap, chapter one, and you can check it out on the, on the YouTube channel, jnetwork613.com to have a, um, to do a bit of recap. So to recap, chapter one was about how to find your potential in life, how to find your unique mission in life. Welcome, Laura. And then we spoke about the next step, which is what we called Zahirus, which means caution, which is having introspection and caution and, and essentially before you grow in life, you need to be using your brain. We need to be thinking, you know, I'm going to use the, a traffic light analogy a little bit tonight. Sometimes in order to grow, you need to put the red light on the traffic lights. It needs to be red, that, just that caution. So you're about to do a sin. And the Yitzhahara is trying to get you to a sin and straight away you're just trying, nice to see you Adam, you just go, you step back and you say, whoa, mm -mm, let me think about this. You're about to get angry and you just think about it. You say, you know what, let's count to 10. So any of the counting to 10, you're about to speak Lashon Hara and then you just stop yourself. So in, in, in terms of essentially going down the right route, making sure your, your sat nav, making sure your destination is the right destination, that requires a lot of bit of thought and the red light approach at times. However, tonight we're gonna to speak about the green light approach. Tonight's gonna to be very exciting. Tonight is about the green light approach. And it's very interesting because some, some of you know, some of you know like in the UK, especially we're having a debate about which countries you can go abroad. So the lovely government in their fantastic wisdom have come up with this green light red light and an amber light and 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 kind of the orange you know the orange juice color light the amber light so some countries like thank god the land of israel is a green light that's why please god me and my wife will be with you very soon in the land of israel but and there's other countries like the red light and then you've got the yellow light and it's really interesting there's a whole debate like what is the point of the yellow light either you can go or don't go and therefore, it's really interesting. I think in, in spirituality, the Ramchal isn't really speaking about an amber light approach. He's really speaking about either don't, stop, let's, let's not go there, let's think it through. Or if it's the right thing, yalla, go from naught to 50 super fast, like a Ferrari. Let's get going really quick. And that is called, my friends, Zerizus. So the name of the chapter is called Zerizus. Zerizus. Zerizus is a very interesting word. It's one of these words, bizarrely enough, it's really hard to translate. Rabbi Tversky in his book says he doesn't even know a good translation. So he says, I'm going to translate Zerizus as Zerizus. But I'm going to do you a little bit better. I'm going to try and translate. And if any of you got your internet on, you can check some synonyms. So I'll give you a few synonyms on, on I'll give you a few synonyms on Zerizus. Okay, by the way, if anybody would like to put a translation in, what do you think? How would you translate this word Zerizus? We say Zoriz. Heavy Zerizin, Zerizin Makdimim Le Mitzvahs, says in the Talmud of So, Quickness. Sorry? Quickness. Quickness. Bring quickness on me. Nice. So, what is, but why is that a good thing necessarily? Maybe be like if you're quicking to a, a sin, that's not a good thing. So, it's interesting the word quickness. I don't think that does Zerizus justice. Um, so try again. Anyone else? Try again. So any other any other definitions and translations of Zerizus? So there's this like posh word, which really I don't really zealousness. Good. So now we're talking. So a lot of the we say zealousness to be zealous. It says, for example, Pinchas was very zealous in his mitzvahs, meaning you know super dedicated focused, deliberate, passionate, 
And, and but again, and it's a good one, but I'm not sure if it's the exact translation of Zerizas. Now we're getting closer. So there's this word that's normally used in translations, which is alak, alacrity. Have you ever heard of that word? Alacrity. If you're, if you're doing mitzvahs with alacrity. So alacrity is a bit more interesting. And if you look up synonyms of alacrity, you'll start seeing a word which I'm going to choose because I feel this is the best word for it, which is to do mitzvahs with enthusiasm, with passion, with love, with that fastness. But it's a fastness coming from love for it. It's, it's, it's a fastness coming from do, doing the right thing. There's passion, there's enthusiasm, meaning... To do the right thing, to do mitzvahs of Hashem. We've got 613 beautiful mitzvahs. It's so tragic that so many people are very lethargic in their mitzvahs. They're doing it by rote. They're doing it, oh, my parents did it, so I'll do it. My peers are doing it, their community's doing it. But it's, it's, there's no passion. There's no love. There's no excitement. There's no zealousness. There's no enthusiasm. And that's a problem, says the Ramchal, for you, you, my dear friends who are listening, for you to fulfill your potential, says the Ramchal, based on Rav Pinnacles Ben Yoye, Zerizus, enthusiasm, which I'm going to translate it as, to be enthusiastic in your spirituality is absolutely pivotal. If you go along kicking and screaming, it's not going to work. The Yitzhahara is way too clever, way too smart, way too cunning to to succeed if you're just going to go. Because if you're just going to go because you have to, in the end, you won't do it. The only way to really spiritually succeed and to grow and to climb this, this spiritual ascent of, of, of the metaphor of Mount Everest is to do it with enthusiasm and to do it with love and to do it with passion. So let's, let's have a look what this means and let's have a look how to achieve it. So let's go from the book itself. So he says the following. Ah, has reasons after vigilance, after this caution, after the red light. You've, you've gone the red light approach. You've been careful. You're, being, you're now a careful person. You're now cautious. Now you go from caution to, to enthusiasm or speed, right? So vigilance centers on the negative commandments, but enthusiasm focuses on the positive commandments. And says the Ramchal, this is what it means in the famous verse. In Tehillim, Sor meira va'asei tov. Some I'm sure many of you know very, very well. But David HaMelech writes that for you to be close to Hashem, we need to do two things, everybody. Sor meira, turn away from evil. That's the red light approach. Just learn how to say no. Just say no. But then, va'asei tov. But then you have to do good. We're not a religion that believes in just abstention. That just... Being just doing nothing, refraining, that's half the job. That's the first part. The second part is doing, but us doing good, Dafka, doing good. And now it's beautiful because now your brain's in control. Now you're being cautious. When you do good, essentially your, your Yates Tov, your good inclination is mastering you, is navigating you. In fact, there's a beautiful... Kotzka Rebbe, the Kotzka Rebbe says, and this was genius Kotzka. So the normal understanding is Sume Ra, you turn away from bad. And then Vyase Tov, he would say no. Sume Ra Vyase Tov, meaning you will turn away from bad when you are doing good. Meaning doing good is going to be the greatest mechanism, the greatest red light in a way to enable you to prevent you from doing bad. For example, now, those of you who are now hopefully enthralled and focused now on this share and just really learning, trying to hear the words of the Ramchal. And you've got nothing, no other screens on, no other external stuff going on. You're not being distracted at all. You are just focused on the holy words of Torah. If you do this for the next 50 minutes, 48 minutes, you're not going to sin unless you start thinking bad things about me and then please don't. But if you're able to just hear the words of Torah, with an openness of heart, with love, with no judgment. As we spoke last time about Kabbalah Satorah means to receive it without your ego, to learn, let the Torah just fall into you. So you're just processing, absorbing, hearing the words of Torah, receiving the words of Torah. You won't be able to do a sin. And it's very interesting. You see some people, and you can you know, see which ones, the two you are. Some of you 
will be very, very good at the Sumira. You'll be very good at the first part of the Ramchal, which is the heroes. You know, people who are more Gevura personality types, more practical, thought through, rational, have good self-control. People with really good self-control are able to to really, um, as I said, to, to know how to have spiritual control. They're good at that. Many people who are the more chesed personality types, who are more emotional, like the Avram Avinus. They're, they're just trying to give, 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 where their strength isn't necessarily Gevura. Dafka for them, one, it's much easier to avoid bad by doing good. It's a very deep idea. Just getting absorbed so much in mitzvahs. This is what the Kotzka Rebbe is saying. This is one of the aspects of Hasidus. You should see really Hasidus is very much about Zerizus. Rebbe Levi Yitzchok Abedicia was very into just doing things with love. He was famous for being really intense and passionate in his enthusiasm for mitzvahs. Not being neutral and not being like a cold fish. Let's just say. So that's what the Kotzka Rebbe would say. That one of the ways of being Sumira is Vyaseto. But the Ramchal isn't saying that. The Ramchal is seemingly saying that Sumira was the first chapters that we did till now. And now we're on the Vyaseto approach. Now we're doing Yala, let's do good. And he says, Vinyonu Shel Zerizus is because it says in Gemara Pesachim, page 4, Zerizim Makdimim Le Mitzvahs. The Gemara says that who's the people who get to mitzvahs early? Who fulfill the mitzvahs promptly? Promptly, Zerizus, people who are enthusiastic, passionate. What do I mean by that? So I think it's really interesting. Something I like to do a little bit is like when I learn these Torahs of the, of the Ramchal, I then, the Rabbi Shal Salanza says you're meant to do this. You look at life and you start looking around at life and learning lessons from life. So, for example, when I go to shul, it's really interesting how people go to shul. Not even how they are davening in shul, which is another story. Maybe one of the reasons people shockle a lot like that is because they're trying to get enthusiastic. They're trying to get passionate about the mitzvah. They're trying not to just be very, like, bored and lethargic, God forbid, about it. They're, like, using, they're putting their whole body into it. Maybe that's one of the um, concepts behind shockling, right? And when you see me, like, rock backwards and forwards. I think it's coming from that because I'm trying to give it my all and trying to, because I am passionate about the Torah and, it, and, and my body moves as a result of that passion. But then I just, when I watch people walk to Shul, it's really interesting. Some people, and I have to say, some people, obviously we shouldn't be judging and everyone's got different things going on in their lives. So obviously you can't draw conclusions in one. But if you're seeing a Shul over and over again, if you go to the same Shul, over you know a few months you'll see that people generally that really really take prayer seriously they make sure they get there on time you see if you love it you get there on time if you're kind of just trying to tick a box and like yeah you're going and now obviously there's exceptions and obviously sometimes the car breaks down or there's traffic or there's problems or or it's just a miracle that you're there i'm giving benefit of the doubt for sure but i'm giving an idea that if it's some, and, and, and the way you should ask it for yourself is what are you really passionate about? Think about it. So, for example, if there's any football fans there, you know, if you're really, really passionate about football, often about a football match, you will make sure you get to the game before it starts. You want to be there early. It's interesting. You know, therefore, some of the most dedicated fans, they'll be like two hours before the game. Like the, 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 the top fans are there like nearly all day. You know, if there's a theater you want to go to, you know, something you want to see, if you really want to see it and you're passionate about it and excited about it, you'll normally tend to get there at the beginning. Whereas if you're kind of uh, just going, it's not that exciting, but you're just doing it anyway, then you don't mind getting there late, halfway late. So, so the, we're, taught, we're saying a beautiful idea. When you're doing a mitzvah, the Ramchal is going to say, if you're going to do it early, it's going to say a lot about the revelation of how you feel towards that mitzvah. If you're genuinely passionate and excited about the mitzvah, you should be doing it early. As soon as the mitzvah comes your way, you grab it. And I'll let you into a little halachic dilemma sometimes because of this mitzvah. And if you had this problem, and this is really pre-COVID and please God, post-COVID, because maybe during COVID, it's been a slightly uh, nuanced 
problem. If you're cutting challah and you're giving out the challahs around the table, we're, we're left with a problem. Because on one hand, as soon as you receive a challah, you should just do the mitzvah. Because there's this idea that as soon as the mitzvah comes, reason the mitzvahs or the real phrase is al tach mitzen, or don't delay when the mitzvah comes your way. I think that rhymes, right? Don't delay when the mitzvah comes your way. So you get, you get the challah. So you've got an opportunity to do the mitzvah and, 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 and eat it. We've made already made hamotzi. You should just do it. On the other hand, there's other people around the table. You want to hand it to someone else to do the mitzvah of being kind and, and handing it. So what do you do when you have two mitzvahs in front of you? Now, and I think it might make more of a difference if, if your father or mother are there because then you've got mitzvah, the hierarchy of kind of kibbut of aim. If your wife's there, which is the most important mitzvah in a sense, right? So... It might make a difference who's there, but there is this train of thought, which is as soon as you get the challah, you're allowed to eat it. You don't have to pass it on because you've now got a mitzvah. You've got a mitzvah. Again, if, it's, if it's, you've got a mitzvah in the Torah, so it's obviously honoring your parents or honoring your wife, then maybe you need to pass it to them. But Stam, if you just have guests, you don't have to necessarily pass it down before you get a chance to eat it because there's a mitzvah in front of you to have the challah straight away. But as I said, ask your local Orthodox rabbi if you want to know exactly what to do. Happy to message me later. But that's just an idea. But I think moreover, moreover, when, you're, when Rabbi Hill is giving you a share at 8 o'clock on a Sunday night or 7.30 on a Wednesday night, try and be there even a minute early. Try and be there a minute early. Um, because when you're going to show, try and be there at the beginning. Try and be there early. I really try and be muckbeards. I don't always succeed, but to be there before it starts. You know, Hashem is waiting. He's looking, who is my reason? Who really is enthusiastic and passionate about talking to me? People who are coming in halfway and late. Obviously, there's exceptions sometimes. But, you know, it's, it's a bit like in school. You've always got the naughty kids who are coming in late in the lessons. And the teacher's like, really? You're late again? So we can be, God forbid, late for mitzvahs. So this is the opposite of being late for mitzvahs. This is the notion of reason la mitzvahs. And from here, he brings up the whole concept of now, so what does it mean to be a Zoris? What does it mean to be enthusiastic about mitzvahs? So here the Ramchal says the following. Let's learn it. Second paragraph. L'chaim, everybody. I made a blessing first, so judge me favorably. The reason for this is that just as one requires great incisiveness and foresight to escape the traps of the Eight Sahara and to flee evil, thereby preventing the... Yet Sahara, domination over us and its permeation of our deeds, one's likewise needs great insight and foresight to grasp the mitzvahs and to fulfill them without losing the opportunity. The opportunity comes, as the Psesim Pirkei Aves, Hillel says, V'im le'ach if not now, when? I really would love it to be your mantra over the next week, over the whole of your life. V'im le'ach if not now, when? Which means you get that moment of inspiration, Inspiration comes and goes. It may not stay with you. You have that moment, I want to give charity, give charity there and then. You have that moment, you want to pray, pray there and then. You say, oh, I really should be doing more to heal him. Then straight away, do more to heal him. When, we, when we're away, we say, oh, it's a really good idea. Maybe tomorrow. It's a bit like when you say, people, how many times do you say, I want to diet? I'll start my diet tomorrow, next week. So when it comes to spirituality, all the more so. Why? Just explain again for those who haven't learned with me before. Hashem has created us with these two opposing elements, the Yitzhahara and the Yitzhatoyf, the higher inclination and the lower inclination, the higher self, the lower self. And it's constantly a battle. And the lower self is very good, very, very strong. And it's, and it's employed 24-7 to prevent us from doing mitzvahs. So therefore, if you do get that moment of inspiration to do a mitzvah, if you don't capitalize it there and then and you quickly pounce on it and accelerate into it, it may never happen. You may never succeed. And therefore, it's pivotal to, uh, to stop the Yitzhahara sabotaging you and spoiling the process to get on with it and just do it before the Yitzhahara has had a chance to even complain. And I'm telling you, this is such a deep secret. If you could learn this secret, it would change your life forever. And, and in many ways, in many ways, let's talk about relationships for a moment. Many times there's a Let's say two people that are dating and they're thinking of, the guy's thinking of proposing, he gets a little bit inspired. 
If he doesn't act on it soon, if the moment, if he doesn't act on it, it will strike while the iron's hot, not literally, especially in that area, but you know what I mean, then all of a sudden that cold feet comes into it, the fear comes in, the apprehension comes in, the itara comes in. You know, sometimes people say, oh, wow, that was such an amazing Shabbos experience. I really want to start doing more for Shabbos. Next Shabbos, if you don't do more, then it may never happen again because that, that inspiration doesn't last long. It does not last long. I'll give you a, a famous true story, which I apologize for those of you who've heard it before from me, but I think for those of you who haven't, it's worth hearing. And, and for those who've heard it, it's worth revision because it's such a deep story. Happens in 1997. Right, so you can do the maths. How long ago? Right, uh, 24-ish years ago. There's an Israeli soldier. We've been talking a lot about uh, the Israeli army lately. So the Israeli soldier's hitchhiking for Shabbos. He's hitchhiking to go home to his kibbutz. But he's not going for Shabbos. He's getting home just to go to his kibbutz on one Friday afternoon. And he's like, wants anyone to give him a lift? Anyone's going back to the kibbutz? Anyone, anyone? No one's stopping, no one's stopping. And finally, someone stops. Finally, but it's a real problem because the person who stops is a guy with a long black beard. And, and this soldier, David, isn't very much into rabbis with or without beards. He's quite, as they call it, anti. He's quite, you know, he's very, you know, negative about the whole, whole religion, about Torah. He's a very secular kibbutz. And he's like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Maybe it's just better to walk. Okay, I'll, I'll just, how bad can it be? And he got in the car. And he got in. And, and then the rabbi starts chatting with him, as we like to do. We like to chat. And after about 10 minutes, the rabbi knew, like, everything about his life background and who he was and his parents and his, you know, siblings and what he wants out of life. And after another 20 minutes, the rabbi saying to him, listen, what are you doing for Shabbat? What are you doing for Shabbat? And the soldier says, uh, we've got a barbecue tonight. And the rabbi says, no, 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 no. You're going to come with me and have a beautiful Shabbat in, in my home, having lots of guests. There'll be other soldiers there as well. And, and the David says, no, no, that's called kidnapping. And I've got the gun. There's no way I'm letting myself be kidnapped by you. Forget about it. And the rabbi says, no, no, no. You might have the gun, but I've got God in my corner. And, and come on, how bad can it be? It's going to be fun. You know, you're a good looking bachelor. Then there's going to be maybe your potential soulmate there as well. We're going to have lots of fun. Lots of young people are coming. And, and, and David was, yeah, David was, was kidnapped by this rabbi, to cut a long story short, and he spent the Shabbat by the old city in Jerusalem. And David had the time of his life. It was his first ever Shabbat. It was the first time he heard Kiddush. He went to the Kotel Friday night. He had loads of guests that Friday night, lots of lachaims. He felt an energy and a magic and a holiness. And what we know is a Kiddushah that he'd never felt before, and David was in. He was loving it, loving it, loving it. He had the most amazing day. He felt, he felt something he'd never felt before. And he had the most beautiful Shabbos. The most beautiful Shabbos. At the end of Shabbos, he's saying goodbye to the rabbi, and the rabbi says, that was cool. And David says, I have to be honest, that was really inspirational. I'm, in, I'm inspired. I'm officially inspired, but there is no way. Don't even think you've got me, rabbi. Don't even think... You're going to be able to brainwash me now and, and get me to become religious because there's no way it doesn't work with my family background, with my friends in the army. It's not going to happen. But saying that, Rabbi, help me because I do want to do something for God. I'd like to do something because I felt a God connection and I want to be able to do something, but I don't want anyone to laugh at me. Any ideas? So the Rabbi is like, what about uh, not to have non-kosher meat? He goes, don't even go down changing my diets. People are going to know. It's going to be very noticeable. I'm not going to put on to fill in. Don't. It's got to be something that no one notices. So the rabbi is a bit, a bit stumped. So he goes, you know what? Let's ask Hashem. He goes, what do you mean? There's a book called the Shulchan Aruch. Now, there's a great rabbi called the Goral Agra, the, the Vilna Gon. The Vilna Gon used to do, when he didn't know what to do, he used to open up the Chumash, Tanakh actually, in different ways. And, and then the, what he would randomly open it up to, God would be telling him what to do, in a sense. So he didn't have... The Chumash that he had the Shulchan Aruch on the table. So the rabbi said to David, let's just open up the Shulchan Aruch and see what Hashem's got to say for himself. So he opened up the Shulchan Aruch randomly and it came to the following halakha. David read the following halakha that the Rabbi Yosef Kairo writes as a way, a spiritual way to put on your shoes when you wake up in the morning. Your right shoe, your left shoe, then you tie your left lace and you tie your right. 
And David said, oh my gosh, I really think there is a God. That's awesome. I'm up for that. No one has to know and I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm not changing my ways. Everyone's going to put on shoes anyway. From now on, when I put on my shoes, I'm going to put it on the God's way. I'm going to put it on the right, left, tie my left, tie my right. And that'll be my relationship to God. And he said, God, I make you a promise. From now on, that's what I'm going to do. That's going to be my relation. That's the, there, the, there you will know that I love you. Beautiful. That was it. They left on beautiful terms. And David went and for the next three months religiously put on his shoes, the right shoe, left shoe, tied his left, tied his right, until one morning he totally forgot. It just came out. Of, he couldn't understand. It just came out of his head. And he's now standing in line waiting to be checked by, by his captain in the army. And he just realized in a process that it happened. He goes, I made a promise with Hashem, so I'm going to have to take off my boots. But then if I take off my boots now... The captain is not going to be impressed. I'm going to be in a lot of trouble. You don't do that. It's the army. But I don't care because I made a promise to God. And he stepped out of line and took off his boots and put them on the right way. His captain was furious with him and said, how dare you? Like, what are you doing? The chook, you're going to go in the army prison and for the net, you're in the army prison for 24 hours. And that was what happened to David. He was in the army prison for 24 hours. When he got out of prison something very, very terrible, traumatic, tragic had happened. And some of you might know, maybe you have relatives. In 1997, over the Lebanon, there was a terrible, very unique catastrophe of a helicopter crash where tragically 73 soldiers passed away. And he, David, was meant to be on the helicopter... He should have been one of them. And his life got saved because of the promise he made to Hashem. And the reason I tell you this, because when he tells back the story, he says that was a, such an example of I got inspired and I actualized it there and then and it saved my life. And tell everybody the story of this. And that's why I'm sharing you this story. Meaning if next time you get a chance in life to have spiritual inspiration, maybe tonight you're getting inspired. So you know what, if I would, let's say you want to give, inspire to give charity, make sure before you go to sleep tonight, in fact, probably within 30 minutes, ideally within five minutes of when we finish, try and just go and give charity. Go and, go and do the mitzvah of giving charity. Or if you say, I'm inspired, I want to say some tilim, I want to say some psalms. So again, within five minutes of we finishing, try and say some tilim, because literally it's all it takes for the Yitzhara. Five minutes, you could sit down, start watching a movie, and before you know it, you get tired and you're lethargic, and you're like, ah. Whatever, maybe another day. So the way to stop the Yitzhahara getting in and saying, eh, manana, maybe tomorrow, another time, macha, shavua ba, next week. The way to prevent that is there and then. And that's maybe one of the ideas of mitzvah, gereris mitzvah. One mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. So now we're doing the mitzvah of learning Torah. So hopefully that mitzvah can then lead to another mitzvah tonight. And then maybe that mitzvah can lead to another mitzvah. But the whole point is it leads to it immediately. Because if it doesn't lead to it immediately, then what normally happens, there's an Avera is going to happen, a sin. And then the Pirkei Avot says, conversely, Avera, Gereris, Avera. One sin leads to another. So it's kind of the question of like, which train are we going to get on? Are we getting on the mitzvah train where one mitzvah leads to another mitzvah, which leads to another mitzvah? And please God, then you get so tired, you say the Shema, and then you go to sleep, and then you're not doing at least sins. And if you're in Israel, you're doing the mitzvah of sleeping in Israel. Or if it's Sukkot and you're sleeping in the Sukkah, you're doing the mitzvah of sleeping in the Sukkah. At least you're not sinning when we're sleeping, we're hoping, which is a great thing. And then you wake up in the morning, you say, Moda'ani, meaning the whole concept of the Code of Jewish Law is there to try and help us. The moment we wake up, you do a mitzvah. Moda'ani, you wash your hands, you stand and tell us you're dying. We start praying in the morning because it's trying to help you just do one mitzvah leading to another mitzvah. You know, I have a custom before I pray always to give charity, always to give charity. Before you're asking charity from Hashem, Hashem wants to see that you're giving charity. That's pivotal. So get on the mitzvah gereris mitzvah train. And because if you're not on that train, unfortunately, we're on the other train, which is called the Avera gereris Avera train, that one sin leads to another sin train. And therefore, this notion of zerizus, doing things with quickness, with enthusiasm, with passion, with pace, is a very deep secret about how to spiritually grow. By the way, it's also the deep secret of how to lose weight for those who want to diet. That same idea if you want to, if you're inspired or if you want to break any addiction or habit that moment, you want to 
you get inspired to break the addiction, you've got to act there and then. You've got to stop acting. The diet starts now. Like, now, now, now. I think that's one of the genius of, of the word, of the motto of Nike, just do it. I think it's genius. It's based on Pirkei Ovis. I think, if not now, when? Just do it. I mean, just, just get on. Just do, do, do. I think that just do it is almost a call for Zerizus, a call for action. Just get, just get on with it. Just do it. And then before you know it, then the Itzahara can't, can't stop you on the way. That's the way to curtail the Itzahara from curtailing you, just getting on with it and doing it. Okay, so let's have a look. So says the, the Ramchal, for in the same way that the evil inclination works as influence and endeavors by subterfuge to lure man into the net of transgression, it also attempts to prevent him from fulfilling the mitzvahs and to take them away from him. If one becomes lax and lazy, and does not act rigorously in pursuing them and in holding on to them, he will find himself empty and devoid of them, God forbid. And therefore we come up with this very important new word now, which the Ramchal says, which is really laziness, my friends, is the opposite of Zerizus. So again, if you've got another better word for Zerizus now, looking up opposites of laziness, please let me know. But this word of doing things with enthusiasm but here's what we need to understand, that laziness is almost going to be our default position. And this is really scary. He goes on to explain that since we are made of, our bodies come from the ground. Adam comes from Adama, from the earth. We're all, our body, our physicality is earthly. Therefore, what comes natural to the body, it loves nothing more than just to lie down on the sand in the, in the sea, in, in, with, with the sun, like a dog. Loves it. Just to do nothing. Isn't it delicious, everybody? How many of you are waiting just to be able to, at the end of the year, just to do nothing for a while? But it's delicious for the Yitzhahara, not so good for the Yitzhah We do need to look after our body sometimes, and we do need to have like a refueling. That's fine, as long as we're doing it for the sake of a mitzvah. So there's a mitzvah in the Torah, in the Shmatem, Ma'od and Nafsh Yosechem, you need to look after your body very much. It's one of the only times it says Ma'od. In the Shmatem, Ma'od and Nafsh Yosechem, it's got to be very much you got to look after your health and look after your body because otherwise you don't have a healthy vehicle to do mitzvahs with. So for sure you have to look after your body. I'm not suggesting you don't have holidays, everybody. I'm not suggesting you don't have holidays. But the point is to kind of wish, for example, if you won the lottery, if you won the lottery, what would you do? It's a really good question to kind of where you're holding. If, if you won the lottery, you just retire and just lie on a beach for the rest of your life. Not a good, good idea, I believe, from a spiritual perspective. God will not be too happy because that's what the Yitzhahara wants to do. The Yitzhah wants to get on and, and have a ratzle mitzvah. He wants to be running towards mitzvahs, running towards really if you win the lottery. It's one incredible opportunity. If anybody won 55 million Pounds on the Euro Millions, let me know afterwards. So I've got some nice charities you could help with. So if you win the lottery, it's an amazing opportunity to do charities, to do a lot of incredible amounts of mitzvahs. But I think it really is an interesting insight into where you are as a human being, into who you are, is what you want in life. What would you do if you won the lottery? But laziness, you have to understand, is something you're combating every moment. And that's the point. If you don't therefore fight it with enthusiasm, the natural propensity of the body is, oh, I'm tired, let me just rest for a while, let me just think about it, and you start procrastinating, and you start delaying, and therefore, you know, I don't know about you, but sometimes just when I sit down, if I go and I'm actually just sitting down on the couch, that's a dangerous position, because then I've got a really uber comfortable couch and then my body's getting tired and then a lot of my enthusiasm and my passion starts falling asleep. So that's why sometimes if I've got mitzvahs to do, just get on with it. Another mitzvah, another mitzvah, another mitzvah, just keep on going with the mitzvahs until you're so tired you fall asleep. I think that's a much better way to live because otherwise if you start going too slow and sitting down and, and relaxing too much, before you know it, you get into this very lazy place this very indolent lazy place where then the passion can't get going it's like you've, it's a bit like a flame where you're trying to cook something and if you put the flame on too low too low and then the flame's gone and then you've got to light it all over again and then to light it, it's a big deal 
especially when it comes to lighting your soul, to lighting your spirituality, to lighting you to be muddlick you to get excited to do mitzvahs. So if you've got that little flame, then keep it going. Don't give up yet. You know, just if you've got another four mitzvahs to do that day, just do them all straight away before the Yitzhah has had a chance to persuade you that maybe it's not even a mitzvah or maybe to do it tomorrow or maybe to do it next week. But we have to know we're fighting against an enemy called laziness, which if you don't combat it, will always win. In other words, you have to do something proactive. You have to do something with energy to defeat this laziness, because otherwise the laziness will be like a magnet and just drag you into this place of lethargy and, and fatigue. You know, as one of my heroes, the Kedushas Levi, Levi Yitzhak of Adichiv, had such love for mitzvahs that, for example, during the end of Pesach, when he hadn't put on tefillin, because Hasidim don't put on tefillin in Cholomoed, he had already eight days living in the Ukraine, he had eight days we hadn't put on tefillin. He was so excited to put on tefillin. He actually couldn't sleep. And he stayed up waiting for it to be dawn. Waiting for it to be, to be dawn where he could start getting ready to put on his tefillin. He was so excited. And he just was waiting in anticipation and eagerness to be the, as, far, as quickly as possible to do the mitzvah that he hadn't done for eight days. That's beautiful. How many of us... Blokes, when we put on tefillin, we're waking up late, and then I'll go to a later minion and start later, and then we're delaying, we're delaying, we're delaying. Or another example, the great Revel Yoshev. Revel Yoshev was one of the great um, Gedole Adar, Poske Adar of the generation. A few years back, I had the merit of seeing him a few times. He was a towering spiritual giant. And this very great man in his 90s, I think he passed away, I think even in his hundreds, he would wake up every morning not at like six in the morning not at five not at four not at three but at two o'clock and i'm sure he probably only went to sleep at 11. so he probably had his three hours from 11 to two and every morning at two o'clock he wanted he wanted to learn torah before he would daven a lot of people just wake up early for davening he was on the level he needed to learn before davening they say in the mystical circles that the learning torah we do late at night when everyone else is sleeping is worth so so much you know, the more when we do things, the fun sara agra, the more you do out of stress and effort and pain is, is worth way more rewards. So he wanted to test himself and wanted to be every night. So what he would do at wake up at two in the morning, he would always put the bed covers way away from him. As soon as it's two o'clock, the alarm went off, put the bed covers way away so he doesn't have the Yitzhahara just to put the bed covers a little bit closer to him and just say, oh, just another five minutes. Give me another couple of minutes. How many of us do that in the morning? I'm telling you the way we wake up in the morning, our whole day starts on that moment. And it's so important. Therefore, like the Shulchan Aruch says, to literally, the alarm goes off, you jump out of bed like a lion. You don't have to roar, but you just jump out of bed. If you're like, oh, give me another half an hour. And by the way, some people, as an ideal, they say, let's do a snooze. In other words, they make their first alarm. And then they snooze it and they're getting up by their like third one. I think spiritually it's a really bad idea. Just my little 10 pence worth. Because you're teaching your Yitzhahara that we can be lazy, we can be fatigued. Whereas even let's say you, you were happy to wake up at, let's say you're putting your initial alarm at seven in the morning and then you're snoozing it and then you're getting out at 7.30. So then just put it on the 7.30. But then 7.30, you jump out of bed like a lion, like the Code of Jewish Law says. Because then you're starting your day with Zerizos. And then one act of Zerizos leads to another act of Zerizos. I think it's much, much spiritually healthier to do it that way, like Revel Yoshev did. By the way, the other part of the story, which I think is just unbelievable, is Revel Yoshev's wife, when he woke up at 2 o'clock, she would wake up even before him, because she wanted to be there to go and make him his tea. And again, you might ask, why isn't he making his own tea? But she felt it was her spiritual gift from Hashem to merit being married to one of the spiritual angels of the world. In fact, she was also one of the spiritual female angels. And But she felt to sustain the tzaddik was such an incredible blessing for her. She wanted to give him his hot drink and, and make sure he's looked after. And so she would get up as well which is beyond belief. And just, you know, we, we're talking about legends. We're talking about spiritual angels in this world. Oh, so let's continue. Let's continue. So now let's continue with the Ramchal. So he says, notice, he says, 
third paragraph, last paragraph on this page, how human nature is characterized by lethargy since the physical elements of dust from which man has been formed is coarse. For this reason, man is not at all enthusiastic about efforts and work. So that's why laziness is very, very natural. Natural to be lazy. And, but to be able to serve Hashem, a person must overcome his own nature and he must do it with enthusiasm. If he allows his lethargy to dominate him, he will surely not succeed. That is what the Mishnah says in Pirkei Avot. Now let's learn another Mishnah. Chapter 5, Mishnah 20. Where it says, Heavy Oz Kanem ever Kal Kanesh and Rotskutsvi. Be as bold as a leopard, light as an eagle, fleet as a deer, and courageous as a lion to do the will of Hashem. And again, why have you got a Mishnah talking about animals and like being bold as a leopard? This isn't some kind of metaphor, it's a Mishnah. Because the Mishnah is saying if we don't take upon certain almost animal traits, these traits of Zerizus, the common denominator being bold as a leopard, light as an eagle, fleet as a deer, and courageous as a lion, is they're all a common denominator. We say in Gomorrah, the common characteristic amongst all of them is Zerizus. And we need to have that. We need to, and you just got to ask yourself, are you, the, are you the leopard? Are you the eagle? Are you the deer? Are you the lion? We've all, and Hashem's given us with our name, with our neshama, always a very unique way of serving Hashem, you've got to you, take that, celebrate it, but do it with Zerizus, and then we'll succeed. But if we don't do it with Zerizus, it's just not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And among the things that needs reinforcement, it says in Gemara Brachas, Torah or Masim Tovim, Dafka, learning Torah and doing good deeds, if you're not doing it with passion, if you're not doing it with enthusiasm, the eight Sahara has been employed 24-7 to make sure you don't do it. So you're going to lose. It's not going to happen. You'll be one excuse after another excuse. Ah, oh, I'll do it next time. It doesn't really need it. You know, they, why does this poor person really need my help? They should go and maybe work harder. The eight Sahara will come up with any type of excuse. You know, so many charity causes, so many people wanting, you know, why are they coming to me? Blah, blah, blah. The Yitzhah has got all the excuses in the world. Therefore, the way to bypass the excuses, my friends, the way to preempt the excuses is just to do it. Because if you do it, then the Yitzhah is like, oh, couldn't get in, too late. I'm telling you, it's magical. You can use this, this trick. Best trick. And then it says in Joshua, for example, Chazek v'ameitz, be strong and courageous. To, and it doesn't say to go to war, it says be strong and courageous to do the mitzvahs of Hashem. Lishma Allah says, Kola Torah, Asher Tzibcha Moshe Avdi. What my servant Moshe commanded us, you need to be strong and courageous. Why? Because once Hashem has given us last week on Shavuot, this time last week, Hashem gave us the Torah. But then Hashem gave, gave us the Yitzhahara to oppose us. He created this spiritual entity called Satan. Satan means, Satan means to impede, to distract. So there's a spiritual entity external force which is there to stop us doing it because you've got part of that spiritual force inside of us god forbid called the called the yitzara which is to stop us doing it so the only way to succeed is as yoshua says to be strong you need courage you need courage you know last week when there was the it wasn't just stam it wasn't just coincidental that there was a rally against Israel last Sunday afternoon around the world. It wasn't just in, in, in London, but obviously the, those of us who are in London, we know what happened in London and a whole convoy of cars came in screaming anti-Semitic abuse. Not, I'm not gonna say the words they said on a, on a holy sheer like you're saying, but it, let's say it wasn't very holy, very threatening words to the Jewish people, very threatening words, very scary words. And it definitely made some people unfortunately not go to shore that night because it was Shavuot night and, and we had to go to Shul, first of all, for Mariv, and then they were gonna, we had to come home, and then go back to Shul, like midnight, right in the morning, and then we're going to be walking the streets. Two, three in the morning, we have no idea if these threats, if the, how much, the, you know, these threats, God forbid, could have been realized. And I am convinced many people said, you're oh, a little bit scary, let's not go, I have to look after my body, you can't do anything dangerous, the mitzvah of not look, all the, all the spiritual excuses in the world of pikuach nefesh not to go. And, and obviously, my Yitzhahara tried it on me, and I'm like, there is no way, no way. 
these um, lovely cousins of ours is going to prevent me from, I was giving a share of Shavuos night. No way, forget about it. I'm, I'm going, come what may. And, and, uh, but I, I'm sure, again, it was a kind of almost a spiritual test for us because just before you do mitzvahs, that's why Rabbi Nachman would say a lot just on a Friday afternoon. Often there's a balagan, there's chaos just before Shabbat because there's huge holiness and the Yitzhara wants at least to get you in a bad mood, to get you angry, to get you not in a good place with your family members. That's why engagements, we really, really recommend. They shouldn't be too long because please God, those who of you singles, I give you a bracha, you should get engaged and get married. We should have a quick engagement. So I want to say, a big on main should be said to that. You should have a quick engagement because engagements, again, that phase is a dangerous time spiritually because there's such a big mitzvah of getting under the chuppah that we need to get under the chuppah as soon as possible without delay. So for example, even on the day of the chuppah, there's the, uh, there's the spiritual idea of you shouldn't even be alone in the street. You should be with, with, with the shoma, right? You should be, people should be walking with you because when you, you're susceptible, when you're alone, on your wedding day. The same idea, just before you do mitzvahs, we're susceptible and therefore just get on with it and do the mitzvah before the Yetzirah has had a chance to persuade you from doing it. That's what the Ramchal says. And then he goes on to say the following. He has a, an amazing verse from King Solomon, from Shlomo Amalek. Shlomo Amalek writes in Mishle, and again, you can check this out. It's chapter six, verse 10. He says the following. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of hands in order to rest, as your poverty will arrive as suddenly as one who walks hurriedly and your deficiency as fast as the man who shields his king when at war. What does that mean? Right? So what, what does that mean? Finally, my daughter's twigged. It's taken you uh, these years to cut the Friday afternoon problem, Brocky. At least you've got it now. So Shlomo Melech is saying this, everybody. It's funny because a lot of um, self-help coaches might say, you've got to be calm, you have to, you know, take things slowly, relax, you know, relax, have some rest, have a little bit of a rest here, a bit of a nice cup of tea there, chill out. Be saying if you do that, then poverty is going to arise. The Yitzhahar is going to get in because he writes for the late lazy person, even though he does no harm actively, nevertheless harms himself through his passivity. Amazing. Says Shlomo Melech, when you're passive, then you're not active. And when you're passive, then you've almost shut off the engine for the Yitzhahar, the Yitzhatov. So your Yitzhatov needs the engine, needs to go, right? You need to turn on the engine, that ignition. You need to ignite your soul. You need to be all excited and ignited. Was the Itzahara wants to like put a wet cloth over it and just to just to chill you out and eh, don't be so excited, you know. Let's relax about it. Let's slow down, slow down. By the time you slow down, you've fallen asleep, and the Itzah the Itzatov's unfortunately has no ability to wake yourself up. That's what King Solomon's saying. If you go to Mishlei, also chapter eighteen, verse nine, he says similarly, one who is lax in his work is a brother to the master of destruction. So basically, Shlomo Melech is not into laziness. Atzlut, not a good thing. Horrific thing. Even though he's not the destructive agent who directly commits the evil, there is not much difference between them. In reality, says, says the Ramchal, he is his brother and they're equally harmful. So laziness essentially lets in the Eight Sahara to say, let's not do it. Do you hear what's going on? So if you could be in a place of passion, movement, energy, going from one mitzvah to another, hopefully with a smile on your face. The Eight Sahara can't get in. What the Eight Sahara wants, just slow down. Let's just sit down with a cup of tea, put on Netflix, and before you know it, it's got you for the rest of the night. So it's a really important, let's say, you, you're, let's say you've got an evening where you've got some mitzvahs you want to do. Let's say you want to learn some Torah, you want to do some prayer, you want to give some charity, and you want to relax. I really, really recommend First of all, do the mitzvahs. Do the mitzvahs first. Do all the mitzvahs you can. One mitzvah leads to another because the moment you step down and you start relaxing and you start chilling, who knows if you'll ever rise again spiritually. That's how serious it is. And that's what King Solomon's saying. 
And that is what the Ramchal is saying. And then he goes to say the following. Sorry? Did someone ask me a question? Come speak to me later. So then he says like this. And um, let's just put everyone on mute a second. And then at the end, I'm really happy to take questions. Let's see if I can just, how do I do the mute? Mute or, here we go. Oh, so then King Solomon writes there, sorry, the Ramchal says the following. Probing further, he says, another verse, this amazing verse, listen to this. I passed by the fields of a lazy person and the vineyards of an unintelligent person. It was overgrown with thorns. Bit like my garden its surface was covered with thistles and when i beheld all of this i considered it well i looked upon it and received instruction a little sleep a little slumber and your poverty will arise so now he says what does it mean this overgrown garden with thorns he says king solomon saying a metaphor says the ramchal aside from the simple meaning which sets out the truth about what happens to a field of a person who's lazy it says the following based on a med midrash so the midrash says the following it was overgrown with thorns refers to one who does not who, seeks and, who doesn't seek the interpretation of a Torah passage and doesn't find it. Its surface was covered means that because he has not toiled over them, he sits in judgment and declares the pure to be impure and the impure to be pure. He's saying a very deep idea. For people who want to grow spiritually, you need to be almost zorries as well, enthusiastic about learning. Learning isn't something that you can do in a passive way. Learning isn't, even for you to be learning tonight, I'm sure you've got so many other things you could be doing. But you amazingly are choosing to learn Torah, that's huge. That's huge. And then you've got to think, try and process it and think about it. But if, if you're on a journey to what I call being a truth seeker, someone who's mavakesh emes, someone who seeks truth, then you'll find truth. But unfortunately, it's horror gets in, it's lazy, it's like, ugh. You know, maybe when I'm a bit older, you know, when I hit 40, I'll start. When I'm 50, 60, so many of my students, they'll say to me, Rabbi Hill, you know, when, when I get married, then I'll have a kosher kitchen. Then they get married, and after the, the wedding, I was like, no, I'm here to help kosher your kitchen. they like, we even think about it when we have kids. So then they have their first kids, and I call them up. I'm happy to come kosher your kitchen. Then when he's bar mitzvah, and that's what people do. They keep delaying. And keep delaying and keep delaying and then it'll be too late one day and that's what king solomon is is trying to advocate us to do the opposite of not to be lazy in our searching for mitzvahs not to be lazy in our prayer not to be lazy in learning torah in pursuing torah in pursuing knowledge so it comes to let's say halakha it could be the same thing instead of saying you know what i know i know what i don't know i don't know which a lot of people say that, they should be, I want to learn more. How can I know more? How can I know better how to keep Shabbat? How can I know better the laws of Lashon Hara? How can I know better the laws of Kashra? How can I know better to make brachot? That passion should be in searching for Torah, in wanting to learn Torah. That's what the Ramchal say. And then he's a little bit harsh. King Solomon, he writes actually in the other book, Kohelet, which we read on Sukkot, the following. He says, the one who breaches a fence will be bitten by a snake. What does that mean? This means that a lazy person's ills do not occur at once, but gradually without his knowledge and awareness. For he is drawn from one ill to the next until he finds himself drowning in the ultimate evil. Initially, he merely cuts down on his efforts. And this has a negative effect on his Torah learning. Because of this deficiency, you will find that comprehension will elude him. If his ills would only end there, it would be bad enough. However, they get progressively worse. Says the Ramchal in his desires, nevertheless, to clarify a passage and a particular chapter that he will adduce views that goes against halakha, he will corrupt the truth and pervert it. He will violate them, the rabbinic decrees, undermine their enactments, and to his end, like all those who breach fences, there'll be, God forbid, destruction, as it says in Mishle, chapter 24, verse 32. And when I behold all this, I considered it well, I contemplated this matter, and I realized the magnitude of the evil within it. It's like a poison. Laziness, says King Solomon, is like a poison that gradually and progressively spreads and its actions are not apparent until, God forbid, death takes hold. And this is stated, a little sleep, and your poverty will arrive, and suddenly as one who walks hurriedly, and your deficiency is fast as a man who shields his king when at war. So essentially we're saying, and if you look maybe sometimes, let's say at families, who are, let's say, are spiritually really, really, really struggling. Let's say, you know, they're not doing any mitzvot, whether it be between man and God, or man, man and man. I believe what the Ramchal is going to say, it came from some laziness somewhere. Just there was initial laziness. 
you know, laziness, maybe even intellectual honesty, laziness in pursuing truth, laziness in actual doing. And then before you know it, they think everyone else is crazy and they're the normal ones. In other words, that laziness then festers, festers, festers. And before you know it, you have a family who are apathetic to spirituality. And then it's almost so, so hard to shake one out of that lethargy and apathy. So in short, in conclusion, what we're learning tonight is the famous Mishnah, for Imloi Achshav Amosai, if not now, when? Next time the mitzvah comes your way, don't delay, don't procrastinate, get on with it. Next time there's a moment of inspiration comes your way, do it then because manana may never come.